I'm Gotham Mukunda. Tonight on Greater Boston, a new set of closures are going into effect on parts of the green and orange lines as slow zones continue to take their toll. When will the T get it together? I'll talk to the head of the T's advisory board. Plus, when it comes to the highest positions in the federal government, how old is too old? And when is it time to step in? We'll discuss ahead. It's a warning that goes out almost every week in Boston. Beware of MBTA closures and slow zones. For the next month or so, the Union Square branch of the Green Line is set to close to allow for critical repairs to a bridge that runs over the tracks. The Green Line will also shut down between North Station and Government Center, and the Orange Line will skip over Haymarket Station in both directions, while crews work to demolish the Government Center garage. Unlike past closures, the MBTA is not providing shuttle buses to fill in the gaps. Instead, it's urging riders to make use of already established bus lines or to walk between stations. To discuss, I'm joined by Brian Kane, Executive Director of the MBTA Advisory Board. Brian, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Brian, I live in Downtown Crossing, which means my life is entirely dependent on the T. And the last time I walked into the Downtown Crossing T stop to take the red line up to, up, uh, up to Cambridge, I saw that the next train was becoming in 18 minutes, mm -hmm. and the train after that would be coming in 19 minutes. I think you can imagine just how frustrating that response, uh, th th that piece of information was. Absolutely. So what's going on? I've been there myself. Uh, what we're experiencing is uh, red line trains that were built in 1969 before people walked on the moon, still in service 20 years after they were supposed to be removed from service. That plus a combination of a lack of people that want to drive those trains and inexperienced people dispatching those trains leads to those headways, which is the interval between trains, being so long. It's ridiculous that we in a 21st century metropolitan wealthy area like Boston have to experience 20 minute headways on our main subway line, the red line. So I'll just notice, right, I, I used to live in China and chi on Chinese trains, the, the, they will actually show you that the lack of vibration is so much that you can put a coin <laughs> on its end for the entire ride and it will never fall off. That is not quite where we are with the MBTA. It is not. So. What, when can, first is, let's first is, when can we expect things to get back to something that looks kind of like normal? Well, I'm a little bit of a pessimist on this. I think it will be three or four years. Okay. Uh, we've had 30 years of disinvestment in this system. Uh, that's only started to get really remedied in the last two or three. Unfortunately, you can't fix 30 years of disinvestment in 30 days or even 30 months. It's going to be more like 48 months. So I'll say, it's, and it's not just a question of delays, right? So the, according to an FDA report from September 14th, effective immediately, mm -hmm. right, the federal government has intervened and said the MBTA must notify it of all misses that occur within two hours, yes. that it has to provide a detailed explanation of the delays and reporting, like the actions taken to ensure that they won't occur in the future. I mean, delays in reporting near misses? That's not even about underinvestment. Something else is going on there. What you're seeing there is a lack of managerial experience. And so let me see if I can explain this. Yeah. For the last sort of 20 years, since about 2001, 2000, the T is operated under an austerity model. The state governments and, and, and multiple governors, multiple legislatures have said to them, you need to cut back on what you're spending. Spend less, spend less, spend less. The legislature encouraged them to raise fares. The legislature encouraged them to increase things called own source revenue, which is money they get from advertising and parking. In response to that, the T cut its workforce dramatically. When I left the T in 2018, there were only 5,500 employees. Now they're trying to get back to 7,000. So you can imagine that we were all doing two or three different things. On top of that, in 2017, they had something called a retirement incentive program where lots of the most experienced people just walked out the door because they were encouraged to. And those positions were backfilled with people that made less money and had less experience. So what we're seeing now is really the results of those, those two twin things designed to starve the tea, not only of resources, but of the brains needed to operate the thing well. So that's a root cause, set of root causes that goes back a long time. And I mean, I think we all want to know why it took this long for, for the investment to, get come, to, to, to come in to fix it. But from my perspective, when I look at this like, you know, look, End of the day, I'll, t I'll take an Uber. I'll, like, it's not that big a deal for me. But there are plenty of people for whom, if they can't operate the T, it is a huge problem. Absolutely. A huge problem in their life. Absolutely. So what's the T doing to help those people? 
Well, the T has a number of programs that they're trying to do, but they're really trying to fix the system and make it safe and reliable and frequent for everybody. And that's what we need to have happen here in, in Massachusetts. Specifically for, for folks that are really transit dependent, there's a number of programs to make the system cheaper. But unfortunately, the reliability and the frequency are still, they're gonna suffer, like we all are suffering. There is no end in sight for two or three years, unfortunately. I mean, does the, teeny, does the MBTA need more, more investment from the state in order to make this actually get fixed, or? Well, they're looking at about a $250 million deficit in their operating budget in mm -hmm. fiscal 25, so I would argue yes. The T has not had a balanced budget in reality since about 2001. Now there have been years where through some smoke and some engineer, some what, what one board general, man, what one board chairman called fiscal engineering, they have balanced budgets, but it's not real. Uh, at the end of the day, they're always stretching at the very end to make it. So they don't have enough investment. Now people, I understand, are not jumping up and down to give the team more money right now because they're having terrible experiences. I would also argue, though, however, that we've tried austerity now for almost 30 years, 20 years, 30 years. It hasn't worked. Maybe we should try something else. So, I mean, we all want it fixed. It's, it's a critical part of, it's part of what makes Boston so, such a great city to live in. So when it's not working, it's a huge problem. But I think the criticism that a lot of us would make is about communication as yes. well, right? I mean, again, I just had no anticipation that I would go from being able to get anywhere in the city in 15 minutes to not being able to get out of my train station in 15 minutes. Why has the communication been so poor? They are so bad at telling their own story, and it's infuriating, especially for people like me that care so much about it and want to see it do well. I don't know why they're so bad at communicating. They keep saying they're going to get better, but we all keep waiting. I think it's clear that the waiting has to end, and they just need to get much better at telling us what's going on. The team needs to be honest, not just with, with reporters and, and, and those of us in the media, but everyone. All of us just want them to be honest so that we believe we can trust them, not just to communicate well, but to run a safe system. If we can't trust what they're telling us, how can we trust that the system is safe? Right, and so, I mean, a failure in honesty is not just like, I mean, let it say, that is not a problem of underinvestment. Yes. So, where is the failure in honesty coming from, and what are the consequences going to be for it happening and continuing? I think there's, there's the failure in honesty that we saw, at least prior to the start of this year, had to do with the fact that the T became very politicized. People that were working there, folks that I talked to a lot, had the feeling that they had to do what was best for the governor, not what was best for the system or the riders. And oftentimes what's best for politicians is not what's best for the rest of us. Shutting down the T, any part of the T, for long periods of time is politically unpopular. And I think that's one of the reasons why it hasn't happened very often prior to the last couple of years. So there, but there is a, a new regime in town. I think we're seeing some new leadership out of the new general manager. There's a new board in place that I think are really putting this more to the fore. However, it does have to get a lot better. I mean, so it, everybody wants it to get better. What I'm, I'm just gonna focus in on what you said though, like failures in honesty. Yeah are separate from failures in management. Absolutely. Right? Like failure, like I, you know, I'm a professor of management, and I'll tell you, like, failure of ma failure honesty is when you have lost every connection with your stakeholders. Are there going to be consequences for people of, you know, who, who have said that, who have like said things and made statements that just turned out not to be true? It appears there isn't, and there certainly hasn't been in the last six, seven months. And I think you're also seeing the results and the consequences to the system as a whole. People are voting with their feet. They're, they're not taking the system like they used to, like we need them to in this region for its economy and its ecology. I mean, like, you cannot take the system if you can't rely on when it'll get you, right? That Correct. is just not an option. Correct. So, I mean, what you're describing is a system on the edge of a death spiral if people just stop taking it and that's mm -hmm. depriving it of major sources of revenue. Yes. If, I mean, if, I, I like to say that, if that's a concern, then people need to address it head on. I don't see that happening. I don't think we're in a death spiral just yet. We're getting really dangerously close, however. There is something about the people of Boston and the, and the and inner core Massachusetts where we just love the tea. It's like the Red Sox. Even when they stink, we love it. And I think that is what's sort of pulling the tea through right now. That is what's helping it to sort of be sustained. There's only so long, though, that, that the, the folks in charge can rely on that because our patience is getting very thin. Yeah, I mean, very much so. And Theo Epstein's not out there right to the right to the rescue for the tea, I, I fear. So, well, he's available, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what are the concrete steps that you would like to see the tea make in the next week, the next month, the next year to resolve not just the problem of delays, but the problem of trust that we're looking at? Well, not hire Heimblum. Uh, let me just put that yeah. out there first. Um, 
their just radical honesty. Okay. And that's what I would like to see in the next month, the next week. But I think we're starting to see it. If you look at what General Manager Eng has said about the upcoming shutdowns that you referenced, uh, he's talked about why they have to do it, how long it's going to take, and what they expect to have done. And now you can say, yes, you've heard that before. But if we look at past uh, shutdowns that he has overseen, there's been a, there was a small one on the Green Line near Packard's Corner in Boston. They said they were going to shut it down for, I think, 14 days. It took 14 days. And when it was done, it worked. So there are, there is hope. I believe that this leadership team in place, especially now with the new acting secretary, Monica tibbetts nutt they have the right people in place. They have the right managers in place. They've, Phil Lang has brought in a lot of experts from outside the system, from New York and other places. There is hope. I think we can do it. So you asked me what I would do in the next week. Radical honesty in the next month, I would... Continue that radical honesty, take it up to Beacon Hill, lobby for additional money so then we're have to do additional shutdowns in the future. And in the next year, pray that these new red and orange line cars that are being manufactured in Springfield start working properly. Are there, are there estimates of the economic cost to the city of these kinds of problems? I haven't heard them, but they're in the billions, I would imagine. So if they're so high, like, is there other sources of revenue that the, t that the t could exploit beyond the state? Are there new advertising, you know, like, they've been pushed to do that much. Mm -hmm. But you would think and hope that the simple fact that massive underinvestment is costing Massachusetts enormously would be pushing and putting pressure for other. Are you taking steps to pressure the legislature and the governor? Absolutely. But the legislature has made it very clear that they're not interested in having any of these revenue discussions right now. They're in a wait and see approach, wait and see posture, which they've been in for many, many years. Unfortunately, we've been waiting and seeing for a very long time. And I think the time has come. I expected to see a big revenue package and a big thing to fix the T this legislative session. It hasn't happened yet. I'm hoping it comes in January. But I talk to people on Beacon Hill almost every day and beg them to fix the T. We'll see. If it doesn't come, how bad will things get? A $250 million deficit in 2025 is, is, is unsolvable internally. The, the amount of service cuts that you would have, that the team would have to make would put them in a death spiral. So it's almost unsolvable with the tools the T has right now. And so your fundamental message is, at the end of the day, there is no level of good management that will make up for that, that, that shortfall. The T can certainly do better. I'm not going to tell you they're the most efficient organization in the world. They can do a lot better, but there are bright things on the horizon. 500% increase in uh, applicants recently it was reported. So people want to work there. So they're starting to get people in that want to do the work. They have the right leadership in place. They just will at some point need money to pay for all these new people and to pay for the maintenance that we all desperately need. Okay. Brian Kane, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. By this time next year, the two projected front runners in the presidential election will be 78 and 81 years old. Is that too old for the most powerful position in the world? According to a Quinnipiac University poll published just last week, 61% of voters support an age limit to run for president. In the same poll, 68% said Joe Biden was too old for a second term, and 63% said the same for Donald Trump. And then there's Congress, where top leaders on both sides of the aisle have prompted concerns about age and ability in recent months. So is it time for a new generation of politicians to step up? And will the baby boomers and silent generation even let that happen? I'm joined today by Michael Astrew, former associate counsel to President Ronald Reagan, who drafted the first operations plan for the 25th Amendment, and Jesse Mermel, the president and founder of DeWitt Impact Group. Mike, tell us how the 25th Amendment works. Well, it's very complicated. Uh, probably unnecessarily so. But the shorthand is that if the vice president and, and that word and is important because it means both, and a majority of the cabinet um, conclude that the president is medically unfit for office, um, they can make a determination that goes to Congress. The president has a certain amount of time to try to object. It goes back and forth, but essentially it puts up the uh, it leads to the possibility that a two-thirds vote in both houses can mean that the president is removed, um, at least on a temporary basis, um, and the vice president becomes the acting president, not the president. Um, and that's the, the shorthand of how it works. So, given this sort of level of complexity, Jesse, does it even seem possible that someone would evoke the 25th Amendment, no matter in 
no matter how obvious the handicap of the president? Well, I think it's certainly necessary that it's that complicated, right? That's not something that you want to be easy, that someone can snap their fingers and remove the president. But I don't think it's anything within the realm of possibility. I, I mean, just because think, folks might think that Joe Biden is older than they'd like the president to be doesn't mean we're in a position where we have to be discussing the 25th Amendment. That feels well beyond where we are. So, I mean, even step, setting aside the Joe Biden question, right? This, like, we have had this issue in the past with Ronald Reagan and Alzheimer's in the, in the second, and towards the end of his second term. And it goes back to the beginning of the United States of America. George Washington had memory issues at, towards the end of his second term as well. So the, these are issues we've dealt with before, but not maybe all that successfully. So, Mike, is there any possibility, and even setting Joe Biden aside, right? Like for any, pre we know there were discussions about the invocation of the 25th Amendment during the end of the Trump administration. Yes. Yes. And I mean, like they didn't happen. If there's a more clear cut case than a violent insurgency against the, uh, the Capitol building, I'm not sure what it would be. So is this actually just a dead letter? Well, I think in the case of Trump, you have to remember that the time period was very short. Um, and these are difficult and unprecedented conversations. So um, I'd be a little careful about drawing a conclusion about that. They may have just simply run out of time. Um, and it's a time period where cabinet people were leaving. There's some lack of clarity in the amendment what happens um, if you don't have a confirmed cabinet official, if you have an acting official. So there's all kinds of complexities, um, which to give credit where it's credit due, the, the Clinton White House wrote a very good legal document about a lot of those. And I'm hoping that uh, White House counsel, um, attorney general, have access not only to my operations plan, but the, the Clinton White House uh, counsel document, which is really, really good. Um, and I think if it comes to the point where there's serious discussion on the 25th Amendment, if you're relying on standards that have been done in the past with no connection to the politics of today, I think it will make it more credible, less controversial. It will do less damage to our democracy if there are um, some precedents like that that they can rely on. Okay, so setting aside the theoretical discussion of the law surrounding the 20, 25th Amendment, it does seem like the biggest political problem that Joe Biden has right now is that a lot of Americans have concerns about his age. What's the White House thinking and planning on saying about that? Well, the White House has not called me to share their thinking, <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think they need to do. I think they need to get Joe Biden out in the country, visible, showing how active and strong and thoughtful he is, and talking about the things that he's done over the past by the time we're at election time, four years, and the plans that he has for the future. The great news is that he has an incredibly strong record of things that appeal to most voters, right? Prescription drug reform, infrastructure building, just this past week taking action about uh, oil and gas leases in Alaska. He has a very, very strong record. I don't know that that's effectively being communicated to voters right now, but getting him out there showing how active and strong he is, how on top of things he is, and what he's already accomplished, that's the key to success. So, I mean, the Democratic Party's traditional posture of panic is clearly setting in right now as, the, as they look at polling data. It is one of our strengths. Yes, I mean, yeah. that, yes, you know, well, the traditional formation of the Democratic Party is the circular firing squad, <laughs> and we're, uh, we're well into that depth at this point. But, I mean, it, this isn't just a Democratic issue. Mitch McConnell just had, you know, two unknown, two, two, you know, incidents of unknown cause right on camera. And I'll just know that Donald Trump just gave a speech in which he declared his fears that Barack Obama would lead us into World War II. So there's certainly a case that we're having more than, you know, that the age question is more a, a bipartisan issue. So I wonder then if we could ask, what is going on in American politics that we, we seem to be becoming something that looks awfully like a gerontocracy? Well, I, I think it's, I don't think in some ways anything has changed. What has changed is the technology and we're much more aware of it. My wife and I both worked in Congress right out of college. I worked in the Senate for Republicans. She worked in the House for a Democrat. Um, it was, while it was much more civil, productive, and efficient, it was very tough to see incontinent segregationists with all the positions of power um, in the major Senate committees. And so that's been going, but the problem is nobody knew. You know, we didn't have social media. You know, we had three, four television networks. Um, and there was sort of a 
social compact that you didn't cover, that kind of thing. Um, and what's changed now is there are so many different ways to physically see what's going on. And what is hurting the president now is it's not the partisan shots, because I think Americans have kind of turned off you know, the partisan shots from the other side, they're not paying much attention. I think the videos are speaking for themselves, and some of the videos are very disturbing of, you know, what it says about the president's capacity. And so I think a lot of people are watching it closely. So far, as far as I know, there's been no major problem that's come from any of these things, but people are worried, and I think they are right to be concerned. I, I mean, I, I would disagree. I, I look at those videos, you know, he tripped coming off a stage, what was that, two or three months ago? Uh, I mean, a few months ago, I almost wiped out in Wegmans because I tripped and slammed my legs into the, uh, the shopping cart. So I, mean, I, mean, I think we, people look at that and, and yeah. understand that folks are human, but you're absolutely right. We see it on replay over and over and over again, and folks on the other side have the opportunity to spin it in ways and to add their commentary to it in ways that just haven't been possible in the past. Right. And, and I am very understanding of the tripping and momentary forgetfulness. I'm there myself, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm very tolerant. I think what, for me, just speaking for myself, what has caused concern, and I think a lot of Americans share this, is it has seemed in the last few months he's very confidently stating things as facts which are just knowably not true. And, you know, and, and, and teaching political theory at the University of Pennsylvania and things like that. Um, and sometimes he's close, it's in his own, but it does start to make you concerned that he's getting a little detached from reality. And in the world we live in, that's a very dangerous thing. So again, I, I think that we ought to be treating the president with respect. It should not become part of the, the partisan critique. Um, and I think that the world treated Ronald Reagan very unfairly in this regard. You go back and you look at the clips of Ronald Reagan, there's nothing that's as disturbing as some of the things that we're seeing now from, from, McDonald, from McConnell, you know, from, uh, from, from Biden. And I was there for the last year, and I was there on the last day when Ronald Reagan spontaneously talked to the 70 most senior people still left without notes, without a teleprompter, for about a half an hour, and it was elegant and eloquent and no sign of any sort of mental incapacity. Um, I think the standard has changed because people want to defend the president's policies. That's understandable, but I think if you try to look at it objectively, it's very hard to say there's no basis for concern based on the videos of the last six months. Listen, I'm not concerned with how many trips someone has around the sun. I'm concerned with their worldview. I'm concerned with their energy approaching the job. We can all name folks who are 25 or 30, some of whom have the, uh, the maturity of a 10-year-old and others who are well, wise beyond their years. And I can think of multiple elected officials who are well in their 80s, who are sharp as a tack and doing great forward-thinking work. When I look at the positions of the Biden administration, it is forward-thinking, it is energetic. They are getting things done for the people of America. I think they need to get the president out there more so that voters can see that. But I don't think we have a situation where we need to be concerned about the president's capacity, talking about the 25th Amendment. Anything along those lines seems vastly out of line. So, I mean, the tripping and falling, it's, it's like medically, the tripping and falling is a normal thing. It's, yeah. The most impressive thing was the fact that he got right, right back yeah. up, yeah, which yeah, actually yeah. is a really good sign I'm for his physical not. condition. Um, and, I mean, the, vid the videos, I say, like, he, he, he's about as coherent as I was when I'm that jet lagged, so it's, it's hard for me to interpret. But I'm sort of stepping out from the Biden thing, this is not just about Joe Biden, right? We have a Supreme Court of people who right. are, you know, hold on, to, hold on for forever, long past the point where it's clear that there are some, there's issues there. That's bipartisan. Um, senior members of the Republican Party, Dianne Feinstein in the Senate clearly has, has issues that sort of lay question of their competence. So, so I think we have to ask the question, like, what... Is the political system just failing that it is continuing to allow people who have reached the point where it is not clear that they can any longer do their job, hold on power for not just years, but I mean, for at this point, it seems like multiple terms in office. Yeah, again, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, William O. Douglas was embarrassing on the court in late years. Um, and, um, 
you know, was not able to, was not able to function. We've seen this before. The question is, what do you do and how do you handle it? And I think there are different responses in the courts and in the Congress. In the Congress, the voters ultimately can decide. And I think that what ought to happen in a lot of these situations is what used to happen more in the old days is that the state parties and the governors, say it's a senator, would get together and try to figure out some way to go to talk to the relevant senator and say, look, your time has come. We want you to step down. And then you try to offer up on the short term the most palatable alternative you know, possible. Um, and sometimes that used to work and sometimes that didn't. The parties have kind of broken down and so you don't see that happening anymore, but that's what ought to happen, I think, in the Congress a little bit more often. Okay, yes, So I think about two things. One, to state the obvious and maybe something that is awkward to say, but seniors have huge voting power. And so I think political parties, everyone of all stripes, are reluctant to say something, imply something that might offend an incredibly powerful, reliable voting bloc. So that piece, I think, is real. Whether it's appropriate or not kind of doesn't matter. It's a political reality. The second piece is there, is there are signs of hope. The median age of the House has gone down, not insignificantly. Look at even though he's not my favorite person, the speaker, the minority leader, age-wise, right? Uh, those are big shifts. We now have a Gen Z member of Congress. If you look at state legislatures and city councils around the country, you're seeing folks in their 20s and 30s getting elected. The pipeline is there. Whether or not there's the generational shift at the top to create room for folks to move up is a whole different conversation. But I think we'd be... Um, not, we'd be doing a disservice to your viewers if we didn't point out that there is this bubbling energy of folks in their 20s, 30s, 40s who are anxious to serve and who are maybe at a slower pace than I might like, but are getting in there and making inroads uh, in public service. So it's not all doom and gloom. Jesse Mermel, Michael Astru, thanks. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Gotham Makunda. Thanks for watching and good night. <laughs>